Uh, it's good to be at Unite. Um, well done, you've made it to the last day when you get to the first presentation that is actually hashtag made with Unity. What the hell is that about? Why does everyone still use PowerPoint? Um, so I have made this little presentation. There's me, hello. Um, and I'm going to take you on a little adventure. So this talk is called uh, Two Devs, One Deadline, No Coders. And the tagline was How Unity Changed Our Lives. You can ignore that. That was just the clickbait bit to make sure that they actually did uh, accept my submission. So the other uh, name for this talk has been um, How to Make a Game While Making a Baby. Uh, but in all honesty, there's maybe two positions you can use where you can both still reach a laptop. So, to begin with, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, who we are. So, I'm Alex Trowers. You can follow me on Twitter, at Bulk Paint. Uh, my better half is Leanne Bailey, and she is at Akuyo on Twitter as well. Our company is called We Heart Dragons, and I should have probably put a nice big logo up there that says We Heart Dragons and following us on Twitter, but we don't have one yet. So it's all still pretty new. So I'm going to take you on a nice little adventure. Let's just jump up there, and we will begin. So who am I? Well, my name is Alex Trowers. I've been making games for a very, very long time indeed. Uh, I started out uh, uh, Anybody recognize that logo? Yeah, all right. So I started out there uh, 26 years ago. And worked on everything from Powermonger all the way through to Dungeon Keeper 2 um, before I uh, left and joined a bunch of the other guys. We thought there was a company called Lost Toys. Uh, after that, I found myself at Kuju. After that, a uh, whole other thing. I eventually met most of these people at BlackRock. Uh, there's quite a few BlackRock and ex-BlackRock people here. After BlackRock, I uh, found myself at Boss Aliens. Anyone heard of Boss Alien? A little bit. Has anyone heard of CSR Racing? A little bit more. Okay, yeah, so that's those guys. And now we're kind of doing our own thing. Why we're doing our own thing is kind of the subject of this talk. So, <coughs> like I said, uh, I was at BlackRock. BlackRock based in uh, Brighton back in England. Uh, sorry, uh, Boss Alien. The names are far too similar. And. Uh, my Mrs. Leanne uh, was pregnant. Uh, and top tip, if you are pregnant, you cannot get another job. If you don't already have a job, you can't get another one. Uh, it's not really supposed to work like that. They're supposed to you know, judge your candidacy on its merits rather than whether or not you're about to take some time off. But that's just not the way the world works. Uh, but you know what? It was OK because I was working at Boss Alien. They were paying me good money. It's a pretty good job. Um, and so what we did was, while she was kicking around at home, tearing her hair out, uh, we would got a copy of Unity and set her up making a little game in Unity, teach her how to use Unity, gives her something to do while I'm at work all day. So that was fun. Uh, then I got fired. Uh, I, I lost my job at Boss Alien. Um, and so we kind of sat down and were like, right, so the baby arrives in four months. I, we need some money. I need a job. Um, yeah, we should go and find me a job. But instead, what we decided to do was see how hard it would be to uh, make and ship a game before the baby arrived. This uh, is actually a stupid plan. If you ever find yourself in the same situation, don't do it. Go and get a proper job. It will be a lot easier. But anyway, we thought, yeah, what the hell? What's the worst that could happen? Hmm. So that game was called Glyph Quest. And what had started out as the little project for her to kind of learn how to use Unity, make games, suddenly became our uh, plan A. Now, this obviously gave us a bunch of problems, uh, not least of which was she was starting out fresh, uh, and we didn't know if this was ever going to work. The first problem was the deadline. Right, how many of you are game developers? Put your hands up. And how many of you have shipped titles? Keep your hands up. And how many of you have shipped titles 
when you said you were going to, i.e. it didn't slip, I can see one set of hands, right? When you're working in games, you will slip your deadline. And you will always slip your deadline by two weeks. What the hell is that about? It's always in two-week increments. It's like the standard unit of measurement for when a game will be delayed. We could not slip, right? That baby was coming in four months, and we knew that once the baby got there, we weren't really going to be able to work on the game anymore. Yeah, so we had to, had to, had to get it done uh, before then. Uh, that photo, funny enough, A, it's the only photo we've got of Leanne with a bump. B, that's the Brighton Unity group as well, where we were uh, doing a talk, the early version of this talk, before the baby had arrived, where it was still, we really don't know if this is going to work. Second problem we had, office space. Um, there's the house. Nah. Now, I think that looks like some kind of slightly deranged pixelated dog. Can you see, anyone see that? Which is quite a, like you'd come, you'd come home of an evening and, and there, there it would be like this happy house waiting to greet you. But in fact, what it was was, well, a complete shithole. It was, it was a, a, a terrible, terrible house. This tiny little one-bedroom flat. The, um, the roof leaked. All of the tiles blew off and there were just water pouring in through the kitchen. The boiler broke, uh, so Christmas Day, um, when in fact you can't call out an engineer for some strange reason, we had no hot water, no heating, uh, nothing. Um, also, the landlord had decided that he was going to, about the time I lost the job, the landlord had said, oh, right, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm serving you your notice as well, you've got to leave. Uh, um, thankfully, it was after the baby was uh, due, but... Still, that really, really didn't help. So that was a terrible, terrible flat. It was also tiny, teeny, tiny little flat. Um, the only plus side that uh, I can think of coming out from that is where Leanne was sitting, that was her little desk. And, well, she was more like that, because you've got a... Mm, um, the fridge was there, so she actually didn't have to move at all to get the fridge and snack. Um, if you are pregnant, I can heartily recommend having desk fridge. It's a brilliant idea. Anyway. We didn't have any coders. Um, I am not a coder. I, I, I really am not. I put a little asterisk by there because every time I say that, my coder friends go, no, oh, shut up, yes you are, you can code. I can code a bit. I'm not very good at it. The last thing you want me doing is writing architecture um, and you know, planning the structure of the game. You, you don't want me doing that. I'll write a bit of gameplay stuff here and there. That's no problem. Um, but yeah, in this situation, it was just me, and so I had to do everything. And that was probably one of our biggest problems. So it was very much a kind of leap of faith. Uh, but we didn't really have a choice by this point. So we made the game. <coughs> we finished it. Um, and we decided to launch. This was... Uh, funnily enough, two weeks before the baby was born, it turned out. So we were quite excited. We had this thing. And we, had, it, we knew it was quite a fun game. It's one of those things where um, you'll find a bug in the game. There's something you want to go in and you fix it. And you need to test whether or not the fix has actually worked. So you start playing the game to get to the point where you can find the bug and see if you fixed it. And yep, sure enough, you fixed it. And then half an hour later, you're like, well, now I'm actually just playing it. Playing it, playing it. And that's when you know you've got something really, really cool. And um, we were doing that for quite a bit. And there, there was kind of the final, what turned into the final week, where we're there kind of just going, I, th I think we've done everything. I think we, we'd kind of run out of big lists and everything. So we just kind of went, well, we should probably launch. So we did. Um, to great success. No. Uh, our launch was a disaster. Um, now, obviously, you know, in our naivety, our marketing plan was tell everyone we knew on Facebook. Um, as marketing plans go, it, you know, it's a, it's a start. That's all it is. Uh, we really needed to do more than that. But what was worse was the fact that um, in my I'm not a coderiness, uh, I really don't know how to use Xcode at all. Xcode baffles me. Unity, I can handle. Xcode was this whole other animal. And I'd done something a little wrong. And so the first we knew of it, so 
It was live, it was on the App Store, we got it all submitted, brilliant. There it is, start telling everyone. 15 minutes later, we get a text from Leanne's sister going, uh, I don't think this is right. And she sent us a screenshot from an earlier version of the game, like pre-alpha. And we were like, well, no, that isn't right. But that was the version that was on the store. We'd managed to upload a version that was incomplete, had no uh, method of monetization, had no actual game in it. It just was terrible. And we were like, ah, whoops, we've done that a bit wrong. So this is, in fact, two of the coders from Boss Alien in my pokey little flat fixing all of my uh, 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 problems. Um, which brings me to a very salient point that is going to crop up an awful lot in this talk. If you take one thing away, take that away. It's not what you know, it's who. Um, <laughs> it is vital, 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 vital that you have a support network. You need an emotional support network because, you know what, this is tough. So you need family and friends who can reassure you that everything's going to be okay and you can bounce stuff off them and make sure that you're not going insane. Don't try and do it in isolation. You need technical support. You need people you can turn to when it's gone wrong or <laughs> preferably you need people you can t talk to just before it goes wrong who are going to tell you that's going to go wrong and this is how you fix it. Um, so that's... You know, that's what we did. They managed to fix the game. We got a proper version uh, and started uploading it to Apple. Now, the problem is we'd already told everyone that, hey, the game's available and everything. So, but we had to pull the version off the App Store. So everyone's going, where's the game? Where's the game? And at that point, we decided, right, we probably need to get in touch with Apple and see what we can do about getting what they call an expedited review. So at the time, you know, a re uh, the review, your submission process would take anywhere between five and seven days. But you can get this expedited review in special circumstances. And we thought, we probably qualify for that. How do we do it? Don't know. Who do we speak to? Not a clue. So again, we asked, we asked our friends. We said, does anybody know who we can speak to? And they gave us some contact details, and uh, we pinged them and said, listen, we've made a terrible, terrible mistake. This is what's happened with the game. We've got a new version ready to go, but we need it to happen quickly. And they said, <coughs> um, well, actually, your first mistake was not talking to us first. And I was like, oh, hey, that's interesting. Uh, well, we're talking to you now. And they said, send us the game. We'll, we'll, we'll have a look at it and see what sort of stuff we can come up with. So I'm starting to smell a feature. Uh, and as most of you should probably know, if you're not featured on the App Store, you are not on the App Store. <laughs> uh, your game is dead in the water. So this was quite exciting for us. The normal ways of getting featured, I would say, are, one, you've got a game that looks Apple-y. Do you know what I mean? You know, you've got Monument Bloody Valley. Um, <laughs> or you've got something and it's all super shiny and, and what have you. Two, your game leverages all of the new features of whatever new iOS device has just come out. Make a game for 3D Touch. There are no games with 3D Touch. You'll get yourself featured. Um, three, have an awful lot of money. You know, have an awful lot of money, but big marketing spend, that sort of stuff. They love that because they stand to make money off that as well. We had none of those things. We had none of those things for our game. So we weren't particularly convinced that this was going to happen. But lo and behold, it did. So when we launched properly, uh, it was much more successful. And there we are, featured on the App Store. Little, little thing, but featured and on the first page, brilliant. We're away. And that's when you start um, just constantly refreshing the sales chart things. The, the App Store is actually really, really good. You get sales data back within 24 hours of, of everything happening. So we're just there. Every morning, I'd be refreshing this thing and seeing where our little graph was going. And that was great. The game reviewed really well. Um, it, uh, uh, everyone who played it really, really likes it. Again, the key phrase there is everyone who played it. It's a whole bunch of people who have never played it. And they don't know that they will, in fact, love it. <coughs> but that's going to be your job after this, is to be going out and telling everyone that actually, hey, that's really good. Touch Arcade even gave us uh, their game of the week. Um, which we were very, very chuffed with. And everyone was getting, it was all like four and a half out of five stars across the board. Uh, our Metacritic, were we to get one more review and therefore qualify us for a Metacritic, would be somewhere between uh, 85 and 90, which is, which is it's brilliant, and indeed more than CSR racing. Um, not that Metacritic actually means a damn thing in the mobile space, but there you go. It's just, I like numbers that get bigger. Um, 
Now, another reason for uh, our decent showing at, say, Touch Arcade uh, was the fact that this was January, middle of January uh, 2014. Nobody releases anything in January. If you release something in January, you're the only new thing. Therefore, people will try it because they can hear about it because it's the only thing that's come out that's new. So that's a, a top tip. January, actually a really good time to release stuff. Anyway, uh, so there we were. We'd, we'd done it. The game was out. Uh, and now it's time to reap the rewards. So these are the sales figures for the lifetime of the thing. Now, what we'd done with GlyphQuest is we'd decided to do what we would call the shareware model. Everyone's familiar with the shareware model? Uh, I say everyone's familiar. You guys are probably familiar with the shareware model. So it would be a free download, and then if you like the game, there will come a certain point in the game where we say, did you enjoy that? If so, buy it. Uh, One-time payment, you get the whole rest of the game. Okay? So it's like the demo version on Xbox Live Arcade. And indeed, you know, it's the old shareware things. The problems we had were that the idea of that model doesn't really exist in the mobile space, or it didn't exist in the mobile space. So people would come to it. There were no words to describe it. People would come to it uh, and go, oh, I thought this game was free, and suddenly it's making me pay money. Bullshit, this is a scam. Or there'd be these other people who looked at it, and it would say, free contains in-app purchase. And they'd be like, well, I'm not interested in that. I want to play it premium. So we'd suddenly got this tiny subset of people uh, who were the ones actually prepared to, to, to download it and then not freak out when we suddenly said about like a quarter of the way through the game, hey, how about giving us some money now, please? Um, now, part of that was on us as well. We really didn't do a particularly good job of explaining to people that's how the system worked. But, okay. but we did uh, 200,000 downloads which we thought was kind of cool for just this pokey little thing. We weren't looking to kind of suddenly start buying Lamborghinis or anything like that. We, you know, enough was enough for us. Could we pay rent? Could we provide for the baby? That's all that really matters to us. Uh, and of those, about 14,000 people have bought the game, actually paid for the in-app purchase. Um, so that's like, what's that, 7% conversion rate, which in the mobile space isn't that bad at all. Uh, at its peak, though, when we'd, uh, on about maybe the third version of the game where we'd sorted out the language and everything like that, we were converting at 20%. One in five people were actually spending money on the game once they played it, which is, that's like a phenomenal figure. So, what did we do after that? That's the game, that's out, that's brilliant. So the third launch happened. There she is, the baby arrives. You can probably work out for yourselves that when this happens, it's a total game changer. Absolute total game changer. And it's really weird. It's like a, um, if you speak to any new dad, I'm sure they'll tell you the same. It's like a switch goes off in your head. The instant they're born, it's suddenly, you're like, I know what it is that I'm supposed to do now. And it's like this revelation. Um, I'm supposed to look after that. I'm supposed to give it everything it needs, make sure nothing bad happens to it. Brilliant. I've got a job. I know what to do. I, I don't know how. Not a clue how, but I know what it is that I'm uh, aiming for, at least. So anyway, that is all. And that became our life for, for a good number of months. Now, the other really, really cool thing about this, right, uh, dads. Any dads in the room? Yeah, and so what happened? Baby was born, a couple of weeks paternity. Oh, sorry, British dads, a couple of weeks paternity. Scandinavian dads, oh yeah, still haven't gone back. Um, <laughs> so what normally happens is you've got your, your paternity leave and then you're straight back to the office, yeah? For a bit of peace and quiet. And that seems like a really good idea. We didn't have that because we didn't have an office to go to. But what it meant was I spent every day of that first year with the baby. And I put it to you now, dads, how much would you pay for that to see them grow up in that one year just day on day. It was amazing, priceless. I'm so glad we did this, kind of. But it makes things so much more difficult. While the baby is nicely packaged and stored in there, you know, obviously don't make sure that thing doesn't hit anything, but while it's in there, it's actually relatively easy to do what we do. 
Um, she had to sit down for most of the day, but that's okay. When it's this thing that you can not leave anywhere, but you can't just, I don't know, it's a lot, lot harder to get anything done. Not because it's a pain, not because it's, it's, it's tricky or it's something you don't want to do, because you do spend a large portion of the day just staring at it going, ah, ah. Or I did. The rest of you might be dead inside, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so actually let's have a bit of a detour. Let's go up to this chest here. So the next thing that happened was there's a company called Chorus Worldwide. Uh, and it was basically, there's a friend of mine I used to work with at Bullfrog, and he set up this thing. And his idea was that he would take Western games, localize them for the Asian market, and release them out there. Because there's this massive discrepancy between like the Western style of games and, and Asian style of games. Uh, and he thinks there's a good market for cross-pollination. And so what they offer is like sort of localization services. Now, localization does not equal translation, right? They're two completely separate things. You can translate anything you want. But what you need to do is localize it. You need to convert it from the one format into the new language, but you've got to retain the, the humor. You've got to retain the context. And just swapping the words doesn't do that. So they did an absolute bang-up job of, of taking our game, taking the humor, uh, changing the art style even to be more suited to an Asian market, making it much more vibrant, much more primary. What we had before was a bit uh, it was sort of a bit muted because it was sort of medieval themed. Um, still cute characters and chibi, but like browns and that sort of stuff. And they made it much more sort of vibrant. Um, and, you know, we did our best to make it easy for him to do so. Um, that is also a lie. Uh, we had all of the strings in the game were just in the game. Some of them were in prefabs. Some of them were in scenes. Some of them was hard-coded in the scripts, there was no one place you could go to and get all the text in the game. Some of it was baked into textures. Um, at no point had we thought, had, had we considered that we would ever need to translate this into other languages. But they, they were amazing. They basically trawled through the whole thing, got all the text out, and did a, a, a fantastic job on them. So if you are looking to localize stuff, um, I can hardly recommend those guys. Anyway. Incidentally, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm writing this talk uh, over the last week or so, and um, I'd got my little guy in, and I was making him run around, and, and Willow, who's now two and a half, she's sitting there going, hey, Dada, hey, Dada, hey, Dada, hey, and then I'd start moving, she'd, hey, Dada, running, run, run, and I'd run off the side of the screen, where Dada, where Dada, I'd come back on, oh, there she is. I understand how this might be a little bit, you know, personal to me, but tough, I'm up here, you're not. Uh, but it also meant that I had to like, do things like make him wave and everything, and she loved it. You do end up just doing stuff because it makes them smile, and that's good too. So, anyway, we get to Super Glyph Quest. Uh, after the first game, we, uh, we clearly hadn't had enough, so we thought we would do it again. We thought, this is it. Excellent. We'll do this one, and we'll fix all the things that we did wrong with the first one, uh, and we will make this one. It'll be bigger, it'll be better. Uh, and judging by the fact that the first one did okay, this will be fantastic. Brilliant. One step closer to that Lamborghini. Um, so, like I said, this was our new game plus, which was a lot more difficult because now Willow is toddling around and crawling and sticking her fingers in things that shouldn't have fingers stuck in. And you try, she's trying not to die. Well, no, she's trying to kill herself. We're trying to make sure that she doesn't die, uh, whilst also still coding <laughs> again, with still no coders. Also, babies need to be fed. I don't know if anyone's ever actually tried making a game while breastfeeding, but there you go. She's probably not going to forgive me for putting that slide up. But um, People always talk about a work-life balance. Um, we don't have one. I'm not sure we particularly want one. We love what we do. We love making games. We'd be doing it anyway, right? Uh, so um, we don't have wallpaper. We have post-it notes on our living room wall. Um, post-it notes is still the best way to project manage, we feel. Um, and so a lot of our time is spent pulling post-it notes off the wall and watching her playing. So it's quite hard to get a full day within what you would consider normal working hours. 
Crunch. Uh, a lot has been said on Crunch recently. Uh, the first thing I would say, uh, and it, it might sound quite glib, but um, I firmly believe that elective crunch is not crunch, right? If you are honestly there because you want to make the game better, because you enjoy the game, you're, you believe in the game, this is something you really, really want to make, then it's not crunching, and you'll work all the hours because you're loving doing it. But the key word is elective, right? Um, if somebody coerces you into staying because, well, everyone else is doing it, or it's expected of you at this point in the project, or that's just the way it is, that's not elective. And what you're doing there is proper crunch, and proper crunch is rubbish. Um, I've been through a few brutal crunches, uh, elective and otherwise. Um, there was one that was so, but again, this is like bullfrog in about 95, something like that, where you, we actually put air beds under our desks, and you would work until your head hit the keyboard, then you'd crawl under your desk, get your head down until people started turning up for work the following morning, then straight back up into your chair, carry on going. Um, that was just horrific. But nothing prepared me for the level of crunch we did on Super Glyph Quest. So the long and the short of it is we were running out of money and we needed to finish this game. Um, and our working day would be at 8 o'clock, Willow wakes up, which actually, again, new parents, the fact that the baby slept in until 8 o'clock is amazing, and we don't know what we did to deserve that. <coughs> so from 8 o'clock until uh, maybe midday, you're looking after the baby, or well, one of you at least is looking after the baby, the other one's working. Then the baby will go down for a nap for an hour or so, or a couple of hours, yeah? Uh, and that's when you can maybe, you know, get some lunch. Then the baby's up again at about maybe two, three. Uh, and then you're looking after the baby until around seven when she goes back to bed. And then you've got maybe a two-hour window to eat, wash, tidy the house, make sure... You know, there's no baby bits lying around. Uh, and then you go to work. And you work until maybe 4 o'clock in the morning. So you, our working day would start at around 8 or 9 at night and go until 4 in the morning. Then, obviously, in four hours' time, one or both of you has to wake up to look after the baby. Then we went on to crunch. And what happened there was what you'd work through the night... Uh, and then one of you would tag out with maybe four hours before Willow woke up, and essentially we, we would hot rack. Um, so, like, if you wanted to go to sleep, you had to go tag the other person out. They then had to come look after the baby, do all of the bits that they were doing on the project, la 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 la, and you'd get maybe a couple of hours kip, and then they'd come and wake you up, tag, you're it, look after the baby, fix the game. Uh, and we were working through the clock, and that lasted like two weeks, and it was, oh, <laughs> it was ridiculous. Anyway, so. Um, now, one of the other cool things about uh, being indie is that you can do whatever the hell you want. There isn't a publisher telling you, you should do this, you should do that, you should do the other. So we largely used uh, Super Glyph Quest as an excuse to stick all of our friends in the game. So most of the characters in the game are actually based on people we know, mates of ours, and so on. We've got all sorts of people in there. Um, but then the other, thing, the other interesting thing that happened was Obviously, a lot of our friends are in the industry or in related industries, and they've got games or IPs of their own, and they were all like, hey, do you want to use our stuff? Do you want to use our stuff? And that's the other, like, so uh, finding, like, Super Meat Boy in other games or finding the Bit Trip Runner guy in other games. That, I love that. I love the fact that the indie community is a community, and it's not about, hey, you're using our IP. It's more like, oh, look, let's collaborate. Let's have these homages or whatever. So there's a guy called Jim Zub. He's a comic book writer in the States. Uh, this is one of his comics, Skull Kickers. It's absolutely hilarious. Um, and it fit with our game so well because they're both kind of riffing on the fantasy, fantasy tropes and kind of taking the mickey out of like D&D style stuff. Um, and he always said, look, do you want to use our guys? Just let us know. So there's a whole story arc with those guys. We got uh, an email from Hato Ma saying, oh, I love your game, we should work together. And we're like, well, we can't afford to pay you. And she said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I draw some of my characters? Everyone knows what that game is? Yeah? Um, and so we've got a whole Hatterful boyfriend, pigeon dating 
simulator arc in Super Glyph Quest, which is really, really weird. Um, a, you know, pigeon dating simulator, but then the fact that it would come across into our game is, is so strange, but amazing. Uh, possibly not quite as strange as the drag queen dating simulator that also makes it into our game. Why we've ended up with two slightly curious dating simulator characters in our game, I, I honestly don't know. But um, we're friends with Kitty herself, uh, 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 and we thought that would be uh, fabulous. Uh, and one of the last ones was uh, Monument Valley. So one of the characters really early on in the game was based on Ken Wong. Um, and so he was a farmer in our game because he taught us how to play Agricola. And then he went off and made this, and we were like, hey, we should, we should work together. And he was like, sure, here, you know, have the totem, have Ida. I don't know if you've ever tried writing dialogue, by the way, for characters who don't speak, but that is also a bit of a challenge when you're trying to do this entire story arc where the two main characters don't actually talk. Oh, yeah, and you've got no cutscenes or anything like that. It's purely text. That was quite entertaining. Anyway, so we had a great time putting all this in. It's a real sort of labor of love. There's a lot of in-jokes that a lot of people aren't going to get, but you know what? That's the point of in-jokes. That one person who does get it is like, oh, yeah, that was really, really cool. I love a good in-joke me. So we finished Super Glyph Quest, and we launched it to great success. Um, yeah, no. Uh, we did speak to Apple first. We did get featured. We did upload the correct version. So great success. Um, we got featured for two days. Now, <coughs> one of the reasons for this was when we decided to launch it. Remember what I said about launching in January and that being really, really cool? This one was launched in October. That is really, really not cool. Uh, it was launched just as the iOS update hit, so everyone else was releasing updates to their games that supported the new iOS. So the marketplace is flooded with new games, or flooded with updates. It was released at, uh, in October, which is the run-up to Thanksgiving, which is the run-up to Christmas. So all of the heavy hitters were out releasing new games. That's when everyone wants to release. So our game was just vanishing. It was also released at the time when Gamergate really, really got into its swing. So our main, our main approach to marketing was telling the people that we knew was speaking to journalist friends of ours. Hey, look, you know, we've got this thing. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then Gamergate hit, and all of that went away because they couldn't be seen to be playing favorites or anything like that. So suddenly, we were dead in the water. And I'm sure Gamergate is about ethics. And I'm sure it matters when these are big companies doing it. But it's, it's frankly, it's me and Leanne, and this is our lifeline. We as you saw earlier, it's not what you know, it's who. We absolutely, absolutely rely on the good graces of our friends to help us out. That's how this is even slightly possible. Uh, the other problem was, oh no, so the reviews were fantastic. You know, they were like, this is bigger, this is better than the first one. Across the board, all the reviews were glowing. Um, we even made it in the charts. <coughs> I don't actually have a shot, but we did actually make it to the top of the really rather specific role-playing charts, only to get knocked off the top by Surgeon Simulator, that other well-known role-playing game. Um, <laughs> but we did have a lovely bit of banter with the Bossa guys about that. Uh, but as you can see, we're in some pretty esteemed company there. Uh, you may also notice that we're in the paid uh, column, because this one was a premium game. Um, the reason we'd gone for a premium model this time around was the fact that uh, I didn't know how to do IAPs. Basically, I got one of those other guys to write the IAP thing for the previous game, and we thought, well, you know, we'll just try premium with this one. Uh, the demo version, if you like, was the previous game. If they, they can play that and see if they like it, and then they can buy this one outright. So we were featured for two days, and as soon as the feature vanished, we started dropping down the charts. Uh, and as we were getting near the bottom of the charts, we knew that as soon as we dropped off the charts, we were done. That's it. Game over. And this is like a week, two weeks after launch. So that was quite bad. So we did what anyone would do. We put it on sale to try and climb back up the charts, stay in the charts for as long as possible. 
uh, and that was met with a lot of hatred, an awful lot of hatred. All of the, the, the guys on the forums were like, this is rubbish, you're ripping us off. Um, I spent $2 more on this than the next guy. I hate you guys. I hope everything bad happens to you. Um, so I was forced to kind of uh, address this on the forums or on, on, on Touch Arcade and say, look, this is why we've done it. We know that as soon as we drop out of the charts, we're dead in the water, and then I'm going to have to go and find a job. No more games. No more making these games. Um, and at that point, something just utterly amazing happened. The forums rallied round. These are, these are internet forums, and they started being nice. I don't know if many of you have been on internet forums, but apparently this is not the way things work. So we actually had people... Um, as soon as they'd heard outside of the story, as soon as they, they realized that we're not just some evil money-grabbing corporation out to screw everyone, um, and this is our livelihood, they started saying things like, right, you know what, I'm going to buy copies of the game for the next five people to uh, like this post, or have you got a button somewhere where I can donate, or give me your PayPal details and I'll send you more money for your game. Um, and that was amazing. Um, I really, really love the Touch Arcade forums. And anybody else coming onto the forums, we had some people come onto the forums and they were like, this game is rubbish, it's this, it's that, I don't get it, it's blah, blah, blah. And then everyone else on the forums would go, no, you don't understand. This is why it works like that. This is how that works. And they would turn them around. And then those people who were once so against us were now becoming our advocates. And that's a fantastic situation to be in. I just wish, you know, we could multiply those numbers by 10. Then it would be brilliant. Um, yeah, so we faced this monumental backlash, and it was horrible. So by now, we're in a pretty sort of dark place. The, the game is dead in the water. Um, I've got some sales data for you here. So everyone remember the last figure? It was 200,000 downloads, uh, 14,000 units sold. This one sold 8,000 units. Now, 8,000 units isn't very many units to sell at all. <laughs> For a mobile game, it's not even a blip on the thing. It's just it's rubbish. So that was really, really bad, and I had to go find a proper job. Uh, and that proper job involved a commute. So I'd gone from spending every waking hour with Willow, and it was wonderful, um, and then suddenly I'm waking up in the morning before she's got up to get on a train for two hours, to go and work in London, and I'm getting back when she's already in bed. So I'm just suddenly gone into not seeing her at all. I hated that. That was horrible. Um, but then it, it kind of got a bit worse, actually. Uh, the, <laughs> the company I was at, um, and if you find me later and ply me with alcohol, I'll go into much more detail than this. The, 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 the company uh, I was at suddenly decided to just stop paying everyone. So uh, I suppose technically I wasn't out of a job because I was still employed there or I was still working for them, but they weren't paying us. So we all kind of decided maybe we should stop working here, um, but we still needed to get a job. <coughs> so what happened next was a little bit weird. So Shin, the guy at Chorus, got back in touch with us because the idea was that he was then going to do the same job he did for Glyph Quest with Super Glyph Quest. Makes a lot of sense, right? <laughs> and we thought, we'd even, uh, knowing what we then knew from the first one, we'd been a lot more clever about the second one, and all of the text in the game was in one file. One file with all of the text in, that'll make it easier for Shin. They don't have to go hunting around the code or anything, it's all just there. The, the problem was that what we'd done is we'd added so much narrative and so much uh, flavor text, um, there were puns. There were in-jokes, there were cultural references, there, there were song lyrics, there were song lyrics. None of these things are easy to, lo uh, to localize. So whereas before he had to do a whole load of work digging out the code to find easy things to translate, now he had a whole bunch of stuff that was easy to find, but impossible to translate. Um, so he kind of went, I, I don't want to do it. I, I, I don't see how we can do it. I don't think this game's going to work. Also, the fact that it was a premium title. Uh, in, in Asia, it's all free to play or it's nothing. So he was very much of a mind that I could pay, pay people to, to swap this over, but I don't think it's going to work, so let's not do it. What we'd like to do instead is, is make a new version of the game that is entirely free to play and a bit more mechanic-driven than this narrative thing that we've got. 
And he was going to put together a team to do that. And we said, well, funnily enough, we've actually been thinking of doing that anyway, as more as an exercise than anything, to see if we could make a free-to-play game. Um, so he said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't I fund you instead, and, and you guys do it. And that's kind of where we are now, which is in incredible. He's, he's, been, um, he's been brilliant. It's, it's very, very, very uh, strange trying to explain to Leanne that this publisher we've got, it's not like normal publishers. This one gives us more time and money and is happy to do so. Uh, he's happy to pay us more because he thinks, oh, no, let's, let's put another month on that. How much do you need? Okay, yeah, yeah, we'll give you that. That's no problem at all. Rather than going cap in hand to publishers saying, please don't be angry, but we need to slip. It's been phenomenal. But I think it's coloring her view of what a publisher actually does. Um, so I think there could be a rude awakening. Um, we've done it properly. We have a Google spreadsheet with all of the text. Did anyone see the, uh, the snow horse talk? Was the snow the snow horse guy, well, and so he was talking about crowdfunding. Oh, sorry, crowdsourcing his uh, localization, and we could totally do that. We could totally do that. You know, we could just share this folder. We, <laughs> in fact, we've crowdsourced uh, location names. So we, we put up this spreadsheet of all of the different places. We've got a procedural location name generator, and we've got everyone contributing to that. And some of them are a bit weird, but it's funny and cool. Um, so this is our new plan. Our new plan is to make this game, make it free to play, but with actual publisher backing, which is, which is invaluable. One more. So the game is called Glyph Quest Chronicles. It will be ready in three months, because that's when the money runs out. We have learned so much over the last couple of years. Um, I've got a bit of an ego on me. I'm a bit arrogant. I've been doing this for so long that I thought I knew everything up to this point. Anyway, yeah, no, I really didn't. You're always learning. And you're always learning from really, really strange sources, places where you never thought you'd pick anything else up. Um, <coughs> we've learnt uh, a little bit more about free-to-play, uh, which means doing the IAPs, which was terrifying, except uh, Unity. <laughs> uh, did their whole Unity analytics thing. Implementing IAPs in Unity now is an absolute doddle. It really, really is. And so I'm not terrified by them anymore. Um, it's like I'm becoming a coder. But the, um, there's still a really, really weird bit. There's a really weird bit at sort of the Apple end uh, where to set up an IAP, <coughs> you have to, before the IAP can be approved, you have to show them a screenshot of the IAP working but you haven't got the IAP to get it working yet. And it's this weird like, sort of cycle of you've got to kind of fake a screenshot of what it would potentially look like were they to approve this IAP. It's a really weird dog taste in its tail, tail thing. Uh, the structure. Because this is the third time we've written this game, um, we know where, where not to go wrong. Uh, so all of the mistakes we made in the, in the first ones with regard to how the game, is, how the game architecture works, it's a lot cleaner this time. That's not to say it's, it's the most efficient. It's the most efficient of the three, but it could still use, you know, like a proper coder. Uh, and like I said, the localization. We've really, really uh, tried to help Shin out as much as possible. We're dialing down the number of puns, uh, which is upsetting. Um, but, you know, it's something we kind of have to do. It's an exciting time for us. Um, we don't know if this is going to work. We, we, we really don't. Shin is confident that with this monetization model and with the game that we've got, we, we are absolutely supremely confident that the game is good. The game is fun. It's one of those real time vampires where you're, just, you're casually just swiping around and it's like, Hang on, what happened to Tuesday? I've just been playing this the whole time. Um, and we love that. That, that, that. That's brilliant. It's all the stuff that's out of our control. It's, uh, we don't know how it's really going to be received over there. Um, we know that the Japanese liked us. and There was a, there was a, a wonderful article in, uh, I think it was Famitsu. And we got the translation of it. And it came through saying, um, this game is dried cuttlefish. And we were like, <laughs> yeah, uh, what? 
uh, and we had to ask Shin, we said, they're calling it dried cuttlefish, I don't understand. And he, apparently there's this Japanese saying where um, if you eat dried cuttlefish, has anyone ate dried cuttlefish? No? That's unsurprising, I suppose. Um, apparently, you eat it and you're like, oh, I'm really not sure about this, but the more you chew it, the more you eat it, the nicer it gets. And we're like, oh, okay, that's really, really cool. So we were uh, plenty happy with that. Um, we're not just going to be making this mobile game. We, we've got bigger plans. We're going to expand the studio out, still keep it nice and small, but we've got big, much more um, ambitious plans. You know, they do involve getting coders on board. So hopefully I can sort of dial back the amount of bugs that I introduce. Um, just so that they don't lose their rag. But yeah, it is. It's a very, very exciting time for us. Uh, on both the, 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 the business side and the deeply personal side, i.e. the fact that we've got this living, breathing human being that throughout all of this has been, that's, that's our driving force, making sure that she's okay, making sure that she is happy. So all these people who talk to you about like work-life balance and keeping them separate, I, I've, I'm not sure I subscribe to that. I don't see how you can... Um, we're both very passionate about making games. Even if we did, let's say we did a notch. Let's say you know we did this thing and we managed to sell it for millions and millions of pounds, billions of dollars. Um, we wouldn't stop making games. We'd st we'd stop worrying about how commercially successful the game was going to be, and that would give us lots and lots of freedom to just carry on doing what it is that we love. And at the end of the day, I mean that's that's what this is about. Someone once told me you. Work to live, you don't live to work. Yeah? Um, if you can, and someone else said, um, if you're doing a job you love, if you're getting paid for it, that's, it's not actually a job and it never feels like work. And I think that's, that's, that, that's quite important. I mean, um, and it gives me an, a chance to come to lovely places like Amsterdam and, and talk about my life for the last 45 minutes. But I'm going to leave you there.